Okay, well, I've been told that little bit of Christmas is not going to interfere with us. So I guess I scared them away. I'm sure that's what it is. Uh, so Wednesday and Friday, we will meet in here as usual. Uh, so I think that's that was like the last uh, conflict we had time-wise in terms of anything. Uh, so anyways, um, so this is kind of where we left off. And at the bottom of this slide, I just kind of wanted to talk about something briefly. And we're going to come back to this when we hit population genetics. And that is that historically, when we would start different groups of peoples and that sort of thing, uh, they were started with small numbers of founders, what we just call individuals that start new groups and uh, populations. And when that occurs, a lot of times they were kind of related groups, which led to a lot of inbreeding at the front end in terms of that. But um, when you have small groups of peoples that are founding populations, it doesn't really matter if you're talking about fruit flies or people or whatever, but this is a people example. Uh, but when you've got small groups of individuals that are starting a new population, what happens a lot of times is that the alleles of those individuals that do the colonizing do not necessarily represent the allele frequencies of their main population, their source population. So as a result of that, what happens is you get these kind of different allele frequencies popping up in these new groups, and then they reproduce within themselves over a period of time, and you can get these really huge allele frequency changes for what we call non-selective traits. Non-selective traits simply are those that really don't impact your ability to survive or reproduce. I mean, that's what it ultimately comes down to. Um, and so when you look at blood type, and we're gonna come back to this when we get to population genetics, you see some really huge differences in frequencies of these blood groups specifically here among different races. And that's attributed to um, founder effect. Now the second term there is genetic drift, which can also uh, trigger some of these differences between peoples and populations. And the difference between, and actually founder effect, let me say this, founder effect is a subcategory of genetic drift. Okay, so with genetic drift without the idea of founder effect, again, you're dealing with few individuals here in terms of what's going on, okay? Small groups and with genetic drift, what happens then is that you can have individuals that are reproducing more greatly with certain allele frequencies than others and not because they're genetically superior or have a higher, what we would call fitness. It's just the luck of the draw, okay? So again, it's just kind of a random process here. And both of these are random events. There's no selection going on, whereby you can have these big shifts in allele frequencies, either at the front end with founder effect or later down the line with, uh, just genetic drift without the founder, okay? So that's what we're attributing these blood type frequencies to in terms of differences among different races. It's not that in certain parts of the world, you've got a better survival of type A versus O or, or B versus A, that sort of thing. It just happens to be these founders or this after the fact event of drift. Uh, and we'll go into this a little more depth later, but not too much more, but I just kind of wanted to discuss it here briefly. So these are US numbers here, what you're showing in terms of that. And so the second protein group class that I want to talk about in regards to blood type, and like I said, there's 22 of them, so we you could spend all semester talking about just the genetics of 
plug groups if you wanted to. In fact, pretty much any one of these little uh, categories we're dealing with, you can just kind of go forever on uh, and kind of deal with it. So with uh, the second group is the RH system. And the RH stands for rhesus. So it was first discovered in monkeys, rhesus monkeys. And so with this, um, I'll see if I can kind of blow this up this time. I'm not sure why it didn't work last time. There we go. Okay. So if we look at the RH protein, if you look in the lower right of that picture that I just expanded there, uh, you've got a polypeptide group that again is folding in and out of that bilipid layer. So again, some of the amino acids then would be polar and are interactive with the water inside out of, out of the cell. Others are neutral and interactive with the lipids within the bilipid layer. But the key thing is that if you look in the right side of those two side-by-side -side comparisons, you see that the RH positive one there has a carbohydrate chain that's attached to it. And it's that carbohydrate chain that you see there, a series of little simple sugars down on, that basically gives the antigenicity of that protein, of that uh, surface. Okay. And so individuals that are RH negative do not have those carbohydrates that are linked off the end of it. And individuals that are RH positive have these uh, glycoproteins excuse me, these uh, carbohydrates. So again, RH positive is the dominant outcome. So if you're RH positive, how many of you know that you're RH positive? Okay. That means that you could be homozygous for that, meaning you get the positive allele from both parents, or you could be heterozygous from that. And basically you would produce half as much um, half as many of these RH units that would have the carbohydrates on it than a homozygous individual, it's still enough to cause antigenicity, to cause a response, okay? Because remember, antigens, or in this case, we call them agglutinins, cause an antibody response. That's what that's all about. Okay, with your RH negative, anybody RH negative in here? Okay, some of you are, but it's okay. Like I said, you guys need to go give blood. Okay, um, but you can see the RH positive ranks about 85% of the individuals. RH negative is uh, 15%. And if we do the math of this, which I'm not going to get into at this point, because I just try to keep it as basic at this point as we can, even with a frequency of 15% with the RH negative, 40% of the alleles in a group, even this group here, would be the negative alleles and the other 60% would be the positive alleles in terms of that. And the math of this is kind of uh, easy to follow once we get there, but I just don't want to kind of go there at this point. Okay, so big difference between the RH system and the ABO system. In the ABO system, you're born with the antibodies against the other blood type. So if you're A, you're born with the B antibodies. If you're B, you're born with the A antibodies. And if you're O, you get them both. You get both antibodies by the time you're born, okay? So you're pre-existent with that, which is really strange in this whole immune system world that we have to have that kind of pre-existent uh, defense system against uh, blood types. The RH system is more typical to what we experience with other types of responses in the body in that you have to be sensitized to that event before you start producing the antibodies. So this is the more traditional aspect of this in terms of the production. So if you were RH negative, to kind of use those of you that may be RH negative, if you were RH negative and you got a blood transfusion with RH positive blood, you would not get a transfusion reaction. You would not have an effect to that at that point in time. But you would respond by producing antibodies against that 
positive antigen, that carbohydrate group that's off the end. And the next time you were to get a transfusion, then you would have a severe response to that um, blood transfusion. And you would get what we call transfusion reaction. Okay, so what's the significance of this then? Why, why should we care? So uh, one of the phenomena that we have, uh, there's several names to this. You see there, hemolytic disease of the newborn, which is actually kind of a broad, broadly applied term that's not specific. But if we break that down, hemo is blood, lysis, breakdown of blood, disease of the newborn. Erythroblastosis vitalis, that's a more specific name, but that's actually dealing with the uh, negative effect on red blood cells in the fetus. And RH incompatibility, another term, all of these. RH incompatibility particularly is the most specific, but even erythroblastosis vitalis is pretty specific to this RH issue. The hemolytic disease is a little more broad scale because there's several things that can cause that. Okay, so if you're an RH negative woman and you have a spouse, husband, that is RH positive, okay, he can donate that positive antigen in the ultimate uh, embryo slash fetus that develops. And during that first pregnancy, there's not really a problem with that because you've got a placental barrier between the two in terms of that. So you're not having a exchange of blood between the, the mother and the fetus. But at the time of birth, there is blood loss on the fetal side. And that fetal blood actually gets absorbed into the maternal system and she will develop antibodies against it. And everything's okay at that point. She's just sensitized to that positive antigen. And if you look at the top on this slide, if the husband's heterozygous, that means he's the 50-50 shot of which allele he's giving. He may give the RH negative allele, and then there's absolutely no problem. But if he gives the positive allele, then you've got this sensitization event. Okay, if he's homozygous, then absolutely it, you've got the positive allele. Okay, so what happens then is that at the time of birth, the mother is going to absorb some of this fetal blood cells and respond to it. And those antibodies can cross the placental barrier, okay? So if she has a second pregnancy with an RH positive child, then what happens is those antibodies can cross that barrier and attack then the bloodstream of that developing fetus. Okay, so that's why we call it RH incompatibility. Okay, so the second pregnancy, a lot of times that child will be anemic and you may have systemic issues associated with that. But if she has a third pregnancy, the response is even greater. And so with each succeeding pregnancy, that response becomes greater and greater and it becomes more and more problematic for a developing child. Okay, we good on that? So one of the ways that this is treated that if the woman is RH negative and determined that the husband is positive, uh, we can give a shot that's called a Rogan. It's given later in the pregnancy. Um, and if you look at the name Rogan, you've got the RH of the RH factor that associated with that. And GAM stands for gamma globulin, which is a long name for antibody, okay? So what that would do then is it would basically uh, prevent a maternal response to those antigens so that there would be a lack of effect in terms of that uh, sensitization, okay? So you're trying to kind of pre preclude that event instead of allowing it to happen, okay? So the problem sometimes is that sometimes a woman has become pregnant 
Remember I said there was a tremendous amount of miscarriage that goes on. A lot of times a woman doesn't even know she was pregnant. And so if she miscarried prior to her knowledge, then she may already be sensitized and she already may have those antibodies against that. And this, this is not gonna help that. Uh, and then sometimes you've had women that have miscarried and not told their practicing physician that, uh, that they've had that event. So anyways, the Rogam theoretically works well, but it only works well if, if the woman is not already sensitized to that event. Okay, so a lot of times when we use words like universal donor and universal recipient, we combine the ABO and the RH system together. And so a universal donor then would be an individual without the antigens. <laughs> and actually I've got that reversed on the slide, kind of interesting that I just saw that. Uh, but if you have a lack of antigens, you've got type O blood and you've got negative blood. Okay, so it says positive up there that really should be a negative. Okay. And if you're the universal recipient, then you've got AB blood and you're positive. Okay, because you're not going to respond to a positive antigen because you're already positive. Okay. So really that should be O negative and AB positive in terms of what that shows. Okay, I'm not gonna worry too much about the blood typing, but historically, I'll just say this. Historically, blood typing was used for a lot of different types of cases, anywhere from paternity to criminal cases. And basically DNA work has taken a lot of that out of it. It's still used, but you know, with DNA work, with DNA fingerprinting, we're doing a lot better job of discriminating the who's and the who wasn't, so to speak, in terms of that. Uh, kind of interesting, there is a famous case out there. Uh, there was a Hollywood actor who was accused of being a father of a child. Not that that would ever happen, of course. Uh, but anyway, he was accused of being a father of a child and his defense team showed beyond a uh, shadow of a doubt that he was the wrong blood type and he couldn't have been the father. Well, the jury still awarded her millions of dollars just because. So anyways, logic doesn't always prevail. Science doesn't always prevail, uh, but it's the way it works. Okay, so we're gonna move back to some Mendelian work here. So um, these next several slides, again, we're gonna kind of be more interactive with you guys working within uh, yourselves small groups, uh, just kind of yell at each other so you keep your six foot distance. Uh, but anyways, here's a problem here. And so I want you to solve this. Okay, so Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna to go to this problem and deal with this. Again, you guys can work together on this problem. Okay, so how many of you are in lab? Okay, that many of you should know the answer to this. Okay, so I want you to do a Punnett square for this. But guys, this is just a classic dihybrid cross, right? Yeah. So I want you guys to do a Punnett square for that. How many of you are not in lab? Okay, well, you did this in high school, but I know that was high school. So uh, those of you that just raised your hands, uh, feel free to stop by after class or later, and we'll, we'll get you fixed up in this. Okay, and hopefully after we go through this that it won't be that difficult for you anyway.
Okay, so does your Punnett square look like this? So what's the big difference between a monohybrid and dihybrid cross in terms of Mendel's principles? Principle of segregation works on both monohybrid and dihybrid. The key law that's added onto this in terms of the dihybrid cross is the principle of independent assortment. Okay. And so if you take a heterozygous cross, so this would be an F1 self cross, and then the, um, the potential gametes are on the top and the side, and the possible outcomes for the offspring then are the cells in the matrix, okay? And so uh, again, those would be your F2 possibilities in terms of inside the matrix. And so your big R is gonna segregate from your little r, and your big Y will segregate from your little y. And so the first question is, why did we use the letters R and Y? So if we look there, you look at the F1s and you see they're all round and they're all yellow. So we would use the letters R and Y, okay? And then even if you didn't have the F1 data here, you look at the F2 data and that's your classic 9331 outcome. Okay, so that's just a classic Mendelian cross. Okay, so you segregate your R from your little r, big R from little r, big Y from little y, that's your segregation, and your independence is that your big R will segregate with the big Y, and your big R will segregate with the little y, the little r will segregate with the big Y, and the little r will segregate with the little y. So those are your four combination, so it's a four by four matrix in terms of that. And so when you set this up, you make sure your R's are together and your Y's are together, just when you're writing this out, this makes it easier. And you always put your dominant allele first if it's heterozygous, okay? So within this matrix then, you're gonna come up with your 9331 ratio whereby the one at the bottom here, that's your double recessive, okay? And so if you set it up appropriately, then you've always got that, those recessives moving towards the bottom end as you go through this. Okay, so the inheritance pattern would be that it's a dihybrid cross and that round is dominant over wrinkles and yellow is dominant over green, okay? And so how do we recognize this kind of ratio? So if we kind of look at this, the 9331, these two numbers right here should be approximately equal in their numbers. And it's not gonna be perfect unless you're Mendel <laughs> and his pea plants were a little too perfect in terms of his outcomes. And the 9 sixteenths is three times the threes. So this number right here should be triple. Those two numbers. Okay. And then this number at the bottom, the 1 16th, that should be one third of these two numbers. Okay. So it's just a quick way to kind of glance at this and identify you've got one number that's three times the middle two, so to speak. And again, the order of this is set up in such a way that it kind of screams at you 9331. It doesn't always set up that way in the problem. But the numbers are there. You just have to find them through in terms of what's going on. Okay, so again, the phenotypic ratio is your 9331, which stands for 9 sixteenths of dominant dominant or round yellow, 3 sixteenths dominant recessive, which is round green, 3 sixteenths recessive dominant, which is wrinkled yellow. I always have to kind of think this through. 
And then 1 16th recessive recessive, which again is your wrinkled and green. So those are your outcomes in terms of this. And so this question right here, where I'm talking about the probability law right here, let me kind of go to it and kind of deal with that first. And then we'll come back to that. Okay, so the product rule, basically what you're doing if you're taking a dihybrid cross, and those of you in the lab, you've heard this multiple times and hopefully it's sticking. Uh, but if you're doing a dihybrid cross, in reality, what you're doing is two monohybrids and linking them together. And when you link together these independent events, you simply define your outcomes. You multiply the probability of one event, which is one monohybrid, times the probability of the other event, which is the other monohybrid. So if we think about our monohybrid cross in terms of what we're accomplishing, your monohybrid crosses and the F2 again is a three to one ratio, three fourths times one fourth. So the nine sixteenths is a dominant dominant, which is three fourths times three fourths, or nine sixteenths. The first three of that is a dominant recessive, which is a three fourths times one fourth, which is three sixteenths. And then the second three is recessive dominant, which is the reverse of what I've got written there. And then the recessive recessive is simply your one fourth squared, which is one sixteenth. So the product rule allows you to calculate out these events um, if you're dealing with more complex types of aspects. Now you can do Punnett squares and certainly get there, but you can also do it mathematically and get the same uh, answers. Let me put it this way. You should be able to do it mathematically and get the same answers. Okay, so at the bottom here is the genotypic ratio in terms of those two lines. I'm not worried about the genotypic ratio in terms of what's going on but you can calculate all the different homozygous dominant recessive combinations that you can have. And you could have gone through your Punnett square and gotten to that. In lab, we spent a little more time doing that, but not anything of any depth. Okay, so we're back to our mouse. Now that you guys are experts in Dihybrid crosses, I'll give you that hint. This is a dihybrid cross. So now that you're an expert here, you've done it once. Um, let's see if we can take that vast knowledge that we have and apply that to it. By the way, you do have the background to answer this question. Uh, because of previous information. Now, if you spent all weekend studying it, maybe, maybe it'll come up. If you didn't, the odds are really good that it's not. Those of you that are in honors that turned in your papers the other day, I've got them for you. No, I don't. I didn't spend all weekend reading them. I did read some, though. I'll, I'll have them to you within a week. So 
we spent the last 10 minutes trying to beat out of you. Okay, see if this helps you. I mean, you're done. How many of you need a little more help? Now's the time to get that. In a week, it's too late. Maybe this will help. There's the parents right there of that cross. Okay. So if we look at this example here. And we look at this outcome in terms of what's going on. So if we do Punnett square, okay. 
There's the possible genotypes of the gametes of the egg or sperm. And so that'll give you your nine, three, three, one ratio. Okay. So if we break this down, the nine is dominant, dominant. In fact, just for simplicity's sake, just because I hate writing with the mouse, we'll call it DD. And this three is dominant recessive. And this three here is recessive dominant. And this one here is recessive recessive. Okay. So if you're dominant dominant, I'm going to use another word here. That means you're functional. A and functional V. Okay. And so if you've got the dominant allele for A and B, you're starting with a lack of pigment and you're going all the way through to the buff color agouti. Okay. And if you dominant recessive, what happens then is that you've got a functional A and a non-functional B and you stop there and your pigment is black, okay? And then we go to the recessive dominant. That means your A is non-functional and if your A is non-functional, it doesn't matter what's going on with B because you never get there. You never have that opportunity. And then the last one is recessive recessive, which means A and B are non-functional and therefore you're staying at albino. So this 9331 ratio then because of this scenario becomes a nine to three to four ratio. Okay, one outcome, and yet two, gene, two genes to get there. Okay, anybody have a question on that? Okay, so we'll kind of, yes. So if you were to give us a question like this on the textbook, you would give us the information like this, right? Like what? Like this slide that says it's not an A. No, 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 no. You need to learn that. Yeah, you need to get there. Okay. Yes. It's exactly epistatic, which is like my next or second slide. Yes. That's why I was saying you've been given that information to, to get to that outcome in terms of that. Okay. So again, if you're dealing with any kind of pathway scenario and you shut down one enzyme in that pathway and the example I gave you is just a very abbreviated two enzyme pathway. But if you recall the other day, we talked about albinism and tyrosinase in terms of that process and that that is a lot more complicated in terms of a series of steps to get there. So if you were to look at this and follow this through, this would be like a six hybrid type of event. And any one of the six in the way, but usually it's tyrosinase, any one of the six along the way will basically shut it down. Okay, so in this scenario, 
the recessive condition shut down the pigment development. And with our example, it could shut it down at the black outcome or not even get to the black outcome and start albino. Okay, so if we were going to take that second slide I showed you here and put that here, this gene A right here, tyrosinase would be a good fit into that example. Okay. And I just didn't show the whole series of other enzymes in that process. So again, epistasis, you get a defective gene in the process and it shuts down the system. And the question is how far along in that system are you going before you get that effect? Yes. So like if this were to be like one test, so would you use it as would you ask for the phenotypic ratio and expect the 93 to 4, or would you just want it? I would I would give you some kind of numbers and you have to identify the the, the cause. Okay. Yeah, so I might give you something that looks like that. Okay. And so if if I did give you, let's say I gave you this exact question. Okay. So I would give you partial credit for codominance or incomplete dominance, and I would give you full credit if you identified it as a um, dihybrid with epistasis. That makes sense? Because the codominant shows me some understanding. The blank answer shows me no understanding. That one's easy to grade. Uh, so it's just a matter of where we, where we go with it. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're not going to get there now, but uh, I've got one more example on Wednesday. And maybe that'll kind of help you get there. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that for now. Okay, so here's another problem here. And so in this scenario, we're talking about again a single outcome, which is hydrocyanic acid in the presence or absence of it. Okay. And so if you look at this outcome here, if you didn't have the F1s, you might look at that and go, well, that's a one-to-one -one, and go back to your ear of corn, which you had in genetics lab and think that maybe you had a uh, test cross, okay? Uh, I'll just tell you this, this is a nine to seven. is what that is, okay? So they're not identical numbers. One is nine and one is seven. How much you get a nine to seven ratio? You're not just screaming the answers at me. Okay, so let's take our numbers. We have nine, we have three, we have three, and we have one. So to get from a nine, three, three, one to a nine to seven, you see that? Okay. So what does that mean then? What does nine mean? What if we just break it down into its basic unit without worrying about hydrocyanic or anything else? What is the nine sixteenth referring to? Dominant dominant, which we can say then is what? Functional functional. Okay. We're dealing with these modifications of a 9331 ratio what we're looking at are recessive conditions that cause loss of function okay that makes sense 
So in epistasis, you're talking about loss of outcome, whatever that happens to be. In this case, it's hydrocyanic acid. Okay, so we never get there unless your A and B are both dominant or functional. That's the key to what I'm trying to get across to you. Okay, so what you're looking for in this to partly answer your question is you're trying to take this 9331, we won't go to trihybrid or anything like that. It's simply on the exam, you're either gonna be dealing with monohybrid or dihybrid stuff, okay? And so the question is, how do I take a 9331 and get there, okay? And in this scenario, it's a nine to seven in terms of that event, okay? So if we kind of follow this through, You've got an enzyme A, gene A that codes for enzyme A, gene B that codes for enzyme B, and you either have hydrocyanic acid or you don't, okay? And it takes both of those to work to get to hydrocyanic acid. So this nine to seven outcome that we see right here, that is a dominant or functional A, and B. And anything short of that, it's just not going to happen. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. So you need more practice with this. And the beauty of this is online, there's just tons of information. You can just type in epistasis word problems and you can start looking at these types of combinations. Okay? I won't go beyond what we've done in terms of a dihybrid cross, okay? So if you take about, if you think about a 9331, how can you modify that outcome to get different effects? Okay? Any questions? Okay, we'll see you guys Wednesday then. Remember we have class here on Wednesday. There is no little bit of Christmas in here. So you're stuck with me for your Christmas present. <laughs>